Well, at the beginning of every school year, I'm very aware of the trajectories that are set uh, in your lives as you come here and start heading in one direction or another. And uh, sometimes you don't know where the trajectory will take you except uh, a few years later. And uh, as I look at Mike Yankowski as someone I, well, one of the first people I met when I came here in a class of 2005. And uh, I was new, Michael was you, and a bunch of other folks were new. And uh, it's been just a pleasure uh, and very moving to me to see uh, Mike and others, one sitting right behind him, uh, that I got to know when they were 18 and saw God do good and wonderful things and to continue to, to, to lead them. Uh, Mike met his wife, Danae, here. I had the fun of watching that develop and, uh, and then to stand with them at their wedding uh, and their ceremony. Uh, not, well, gosh, a decade ago. And uh, Mike and his wife are working on their PhDs at the uh, University of Notre Dame. Mike's written two really wonderful books. Under the Overpass, um, I was part of a board of overseers that watched this crazy college student go off and live on the streets, homeless, uh, for a season, and then write about it. It's a good book. You should read it. Brand new book. Uh, it's, it's just uh, it's a book on the spiritual practices. And uh, it's called The Sacred Year. Uh, mapping the, the, skull, the soulscape of spiritual practice. I always get the, the subtitle wrong, but Mike's got more to heal out onto that. But anyway, I just, uh, ah, I just kind of like a, feel like a proud dad, but uh, mainly just a proud friend uh, to my brother. Michael, we welcome you to Westwater. Thank you. Thank you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, what a joy and an honor it is to be with you today. And how terrifying that I graduated a decade ago. It just goes by so quickly. Enjoy the season and drink deeply of this rich place that is Westmont. So the question I want to explore with you today is fundamentally, how do we become more who we are becoming as followers of Christ? How do we become more who we are becoming? That's the fundamental question. And really, this is a question that I have been grappling with for a very long time, that this is the kind of question that drove my friend Sam and I to live on the streets as homeless men for six months in six different cities across the United States. This is the question that drives me. How do we become more who we are becoming? How do we become more like Christ? So as we begin to explore this question today, I ask that you would pray with me. We've been praying already. But if you would bow your heads with me and continue to pray, let's ask the Lord to lead us into this time of reflection. Heavenly Father, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, thank you that you call us Thank you that you draw us to yourself. Thank you that you are faithful to complete, to bring to maturity, to bring to fulfillment the good work that you have begun in us. I pray today, Lord, as I have the opportunity to share with my brothers and sisters in Christ here at a place called Westmont, that you would take my words and accomplish your purposes. That this time would be a time in which you are at work in a particular way to draw us more closely to yourself, to make us more like you, to conform us to the image of the Son, to make us more like Christ, each and every single one of us. And we pray all of this in the great hope and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, yes, several years ago, my friend Sam and I had the chance to spend several months living on the streets of six different American cities across the United States. We wanted to do this in order to better understand what it's like to be a human being created in God's image, having to survive, having to endure life on the streets. What's it like to wake up on the concrete? What's it like to be treated by people like you don't exist, like you're garbage, like you're a nuisance, like you're a blight on society? What's it feel like? And another aspect of that question that we wanted to ask was, what's it like 
when we engage with Christians, men and women of faith, people like us, people who proclaim the gospel of love and reconciliation, who hope towards human flourishing, who hope that there is a God who loves us and who has made us and who has formed us and who is drawing all things towards the completion for which he has created them. What's it like when we engage with Christians from the streets? and as we are on the streets. This led to this journey on the streets and I got to write a book called Under the Overpass about that. One story that I want to share from you from that experience on the streets happened when Sam and I were in Phoenix, Arizona. We stepped outside of a very large church on a Friday evening and woke up on a Saturday morning and there was a church breakfast being set up. Now Sam and I hadn't eaten the day before. And when you see these big stainless steel buffet trays full of bacon and eggs and pancakes being carried into this auxiliary building of this very large, very wealthy church outside of Phoenix, Sam and I are stoked, right? I mean, like, this is good news. This is breakfast. We're at a church. Where hopefully we'll be invited in. Maybe we'll have a chance to eat today. We're hopeful. We're hungry. A few minutes later, two gentlemen come walking across from the building where the breakfast was being set up, and they see Sam and I sitting there where we had slept the night before, and we can tell by their body language that they're pretty frustrated, and they sort of look at us as they get closer, and they say, hey guys, you're not supposed to be here right now. You need to get out of here. They didn't really stop, though. They walked into the main sanctuary, and they came back out a few minutes later because Sam and I hadn't left. We're thinking, wait, we're not going to go. Maybe after breakfast. Sure, we'll leave after that, but not before breakfast. That doesn't make any sense. They come out a few minutes later, and they see Sam and I still sitting there, and they get a little bit more frustrated. And one of the guys says, hey, I told you you're not supposed to be here right now. What are you still doing here? You need to get out of here. And I said, well, yes, sir. You know, I heard, obviously, that you said that we weren't supposed to be here right now, that we need to go. But why? I don't understand. Why do we have to go? And he said, oh, well, because these are church grounds. And church grounds aren't for this. You need to leave. Now, I like debate. I like theology. I like asking questions. I probably shouldn't have done it that day because I was pretty frustrated at that point. But I said, well, what are church grounds for exactly? I mean, I don't know, maybe loving God and loving your neighbor. Maybe something like that. Like, let's talk about that. Let's debate that a little bit. What is it for? And he said, you know what? We could stand here and debate that all day long. Bottom line is church grounds are not for this. You need to leave. So we left. That was Saturday. Sunday, we came back for the church service and we came into the large sanctuary and sat down over in this area. And it was funny because the whole room filled up around us, except for this 10-foot circle around Sam and I, right? Because we smelled so badly. And people thought they knew who we were. They thought they knew the kind of people that we were and they wanted nothing to do with us. And after the church service, from the back of this large church, we heard this guy yelling at the top of his lungs. And he said, guys, guys, guys. And he runs across the back of the church down the main aisle to the pews right behind Sam and I. And he comes up and he throws his arms around both of us in this huge bear hug. Now, Sam and I reek. We have not showered in a long time. We haven't been hugged in a long time. This is very interesting that this guy is throwing his arms around both of us. It was the guy who had kicked us off the property the day before. And he's saying, guys, I am so sorry. He's weeping. <laughs> He's saying, I'm so sorry. I cannot believe I did that. I cannot believe I kicked you off the church's property during a church breakfast. Would you forgive me, please? And this is a big guy making a big scene in a big church. And Sam and I are like, dude, it's fine. We forgive you. It's okay. It's, it's happened lots of times. You know, it's, it's normal. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And he said, wait, this has happened before? And we said, yeah, you know, I mean, we've been on the streets for a while. And not all churches, not all Christians, but a lot of places, yeah, we've been kicked off. And people have tried to get rid of us. I said, guys, that's, that's awful. I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? Would you please forgive us, the church? That's not what we believe we ought to be doing when someone comes in a position of need. And the reason I'm sharing the story with you is because at that point, he put his hands in his pockets and got kind of embarrassed. And he said, you know, I, I have to confess something to you guys. And we said, what? You know, you already asked for forgiveness. We already forgave you. What are you going to confess? And he said, well, you're kind of not going to believe this, but I'm actually the director of homeless outreach for our church. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> we were like, what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So let me get this straight. The director of homeless outreach kicks us off the church's property during a church breakfast. How does that work? <laughs> it's called compartmentalization, right? And we do it. We're busy. Life is full. So we compartmentalize. We put God, you know, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday during chapel or Sunday when we go to church or Bible study or New Testament class, whatever. But we contain God. We bracket God. I'm convinced that's one of the most egregious realities that you and I face as Western Christians is how easy it is to do that, to bracket God out. That's one story. Another story I want to share. From the chance to write under the overpass, I've had the chance to travel and speak a lot at a lot of different places over the past decade. I'm very thankful for that. It's been an incredible opportunity. 
But one of the things I've begun to notice as I've had the chance to travel and to speak to conferences and large gatherings of Christians is that it's very easy to put on a facade of faith. And part of the answer to this question of how do we become more who we are being invited to become in Christ is to resist the temptation to have our faith be merely a facade. So I was traveling to a large conference. If I said the name of the conference, you would probably know it. And I had a very early morning flight. And I'm, you know, bleary-eyed and half asleep. And I'm waiting to get on the plane. And in the waiting room, to get onto the plane, there is a guy who's on a very intense phone call on his cell phone. And, you know, the conversation is escalating. It's very clear that he's talking to his wife. And, uh, you know, he's just starting to shout, starting to curse. And it just kind of is escalating. You know, we all get on the plane. And the guy's still on the phone. And, you know, the flight attendant comes along and says, Sir, you need to, you know, shut off your phone. The main cabin door is closed. And he says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep shouting into the phone. Keep shouting into the phone. Cabin door is closed. Flight attendant comes back and says, sir, you're delaying the departure of this flight. Turn off your phone. The last words out of this guy's mouth are, well, I'm sorry I've ruined your miserable effing life. And he slams the phone down and it just kind of, you know, batteries are flying, covers are flying. Wow. It's pretty intense, but you know, hey, stuff happens, right? I don't think another thing of it until I get to this conference where I'm going, this large Christian conference, and I come into the back of the room, and I'm sort of sitting there waiting for my talk to begin, and up on stage comes the guy from the plane. <laughs> and he does his song and dance up on stage, and you never know it. It's so easy to put on a facade of faith. It's so easy to do. Yet I'm convinced that the God who has made everything from nothing, who desires us to become more like the Son of God, invites us past the facade. So recently I've had the chance to write a book called The Sacred Year, and the subtitle, very long, is Mapping the Soulscape of Spiritual Practice, How Contemplating Apples, Living in a Cave, and Befriending a Dying Woman Revived My Life. Long subtitle, I know. But this idea of spiritual practices, this idea of how do we partner with God in what God is doing to redeem us, to make us like the Son of God. How do we partner with God to help the kingdom of God come? That's what I want to be talking a bit more about today. And what I'm going to be doing in order to explore that a bit more is talking about this constellation, a theological constellation of spiritual practices. Now, one thing I need to say very carefully here is an outset, sort of a caveat as we begin. I am not suggesting that spiritual practices are a way to earn God's love. I am not suggesting that you and I have to engage in spiritual practices so that God will love us. I am not suggesting that this is an obligation for us so that God will begin to work in our lives. I'm not suggesting any of that. Dallas Willard, when I was a student here at Westmont, stood up on this very stage and said, look, you need to understand something. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. You and I will never earn God's love. That's not what this is about. What this is about, though, is being empowered by, inspirited by the living God so that we might become more like what we've been created to be. That's where I think spiritual practices fit in the life of the Christian. It's a response, as all spirituality is, a response to the initiation of God in our lives. That's what we're talking about. Not trying to make God love us. Not trying to force God's hand, but seeking to partner with and work alongside of what God is already at work to do in us and in the world. So we're going to be building today a theological constellation. That's the metaphor we're using. And what is a constellation? Well, if you think about a constellation up in the night sky, right? A constellation is a collection of discrete points that when you put them together, they become something of a recognizable shape. So today we're going to be building a theological constellation about spiritual practice. That's what we're getting at today in a way of responding to that question, how do we become more who we are being invited to be? So the first point of this theological constellation of spiritual practice is neuroplasticity. It's a fun word. Say that three times fast. Neuroplasticity. This idea is relatively new in the space of neuroscience, okay? So for a very long time, the assumption from neuroscientists was that largely adult brains were static. They didn't change very much. Once you were past childhood, more or less, your neural circuitry was laid down and it wasn't going to change very much during the remainder of your life. Sure, you might learn a couple new things. You might pick up a couple new ta skills or abilities. But fundamentally, your neurology was not going to change. 
Now, cutting edge neuroscientific and neurobiological research has showed us that this is not actually how the human brain works. Neuroplasticity is the word that has been coined to describe how fundamentally flexible the human brain actually is. This happens both on an anatomical level in terms of the structures of the brain itself, the physical structures, and also the physiology, the way the brain actually functions. Now we've been able to learn a lot about this from people who have had traumatic brain injuries and yet the brain has been able to literally on a physical level rewire itself and reclaim some of its previous functions. Now this doesn't happen all the time perfectly, of course, but the fundamental realization that this has enabled us to grasp is that our brains as human beings are fundamentally plastic, they're malleable, they can be changed. Now here's a second really interesting finding from this notion of neuroplasticity. You and I have the capacity to affect how our brain is wired. N.T. Wright puts it this way. Let's go to the next one. When people consistently make choices about their patterns of behavior, physical changes take place within the brain itself. Significant events in your life, including significant choices you make about how you behave, create new information pathways and patterns within your brain. Put simply, what you and I choose to do rewires our brains. The way we choose to orient our lives, the way we choose to engage in this practice of everyday life affects who we are becoming. So that's constellation point one in this theological constellation of spiritual practice, this notion of neuroplasticity, that you and I have the ability to affect and to change our actual neurological structure as human beings. That's part of our God-given, created capacity. Constellation point Number two and three are going to come from Scripture. Consolation point number two comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, from Romans 12, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul invites Christians to no longer be conformed to the patterns of this world, but rather to be transformed. And as you see up on this slide, this word that we translate into English as transformed is in Greek, metamorphoste. This is where we get our other English word, metamorphosis. The idea is there's a fundamental link and yet a radical change, a radical development. Something new comes into the picture. That's the notion of metamorphosis and that's, I think, what Paul is getting at here in this tremendous invitation that he's offering to Christians. Don't be conformed any longer to the patterns of the way of being in this world. Rather, allow God to be at work in you to transform you, to metamorphose you, to help you become more who you were created to be. That's, I think, the invitation that we see in constellation point number two within this theological constellation of spiritual practice. This invitation to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, by the rewiring of who we are in Christ. Now, constellation point number three comes from another of Paul's letters, of Paul's letters. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1, this is the tremendous language as God's co-workers. We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, let's think about that for a second. You and I have been grafted into Christ. Belief is the beginning of this long journey of being conformed to the image of the Son of God, of being made more like Christ. That begins when we become Christians. But I think one of the greatest tragedies in the church today is the belief, the erroneous belief, that once we become Christians, all we're doing is waiting around for the kingdom to finally arrive. That there's no stage two, there's no stage three, there's no effort to be employed, there's no work to be done, there's no running this race with endurance that lies ahead of us after we start. It's like showing up at the altar in your marriage and saying I do and then saying, phew, I'm glad that's done. It's not how it works. It's the beginning of life together. It's the beginning of what goes on for a very long time, Lord willingly. 
as we are conformed to the image of the Son of God, as we become more like Christ. Now, this idea of being co-workers with Christ, this is a tremendous invitation. The word going on here, as you see up on the slide, is synergoi. This is where we get our English word synergy from. The idea of two different things working together towards a common end, towards a common goal. Not that they're working equally together. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting you and I are on par with what God is at work to do in us and in the world. Of course not. But if we take Paul seriously here, this idea that you and I are invited to be co-laborers, co-workers, that we are invited to work synergistically with God in what God is up to in the world, what a profound invitation that we are invited into, that we are invited to co-labor and to co-work with God. So we're building this theological constellation of spiritual practice. Point number one, neuroplasticity. The reality that you and I, by our choices, by our actions, by our behaviors, have the capacity to rewire our minds, our brains, to become something other than we are. Paul's invitation to no longer be, trans, to no longer be conformed to the image of the world, but rather to be transformed to allow the metamorphosis which God is at work to do in us to flourish, to come into being, to become what it was meant to be, to become what God intended it to be. And then this third point in this theological constellation of spiritual practice, to be God's co-laborers, to work synergistically with God in what God is up to do in the world. So next slide, I'm going to sort of suggest that this is a very helpful way to consider this. A helpful metaphor, a helpful image, if you will. The idea of a sailboat. That the wind is blowing. God's spirit is at work in the world. As C.S. Lewis put it, right, in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan is on the move. God is at work. God is active. God is moving. The wind is blowing. And you and I have been given the astonishing ability, by God's grace, to engage with that to trim our sails, to position ourselves in such a way that the Lord might move us. Now, the inverse of that, I think, is accurate as well, that you and I also have the capacity by our choices, by our decisions, to not co-labor with God, to resist that, to reject that, to stifle that, to position ourselves in such a way that we are not as able to be blown by the wind, the spirit, the life of God, as perhaps we might be. Now, I think this image works on a number of levels. If you put your sails up in the direction or the wrong direction, you're not going to be moved in the way the wind is necessarily going. Part of this is about attentiveness to what God is doing, to where the wind is blowing, to the way the wind is blowing. If you sail, you know this. You're constantly watching what the wind is doing. You're constantly looking at how fast is it blowing, what direction is it coming from, what are the other conditions going on. It's a constant attentiveness. It's a constant contemplation we might say, because contemplare means to observe, to be attentive, to pay attention to what is going on. So this idea of a sailboat, not that we have the power to move ourselves, not that we have the ability to move ourselves towards God, I'm not suggesting that, but that there is a synergistic way in which you and I are invited to partner with, to co-labor with, to work alongside of what God is at work to do in the world that we have responsibility in that, that we are invited by God to play a role in who we are becoming in Christ. This is the definition I want to suggest of spiritual practice. Spiritual practices are intentional and habitual activities whereby we participate synergistically with the redeeming work of God by becoming, that is being transformed or metamorphosing, more like Christ. Now I'm going to show a video clip from a really good old movie that I think helps kind of capture this, sort of encapsulate this in a sense. I think this is sort of how spiritual practices work in our lives. Sometimes they may not be very clear. Sometimes they may not make very much sense. Sometimes we sort of don't understand what in the world they are for, but we are being shaped and we are being formed as we engage them. Let's watch this clip. We'll come back. I love that movie, right? That was a deeply formative movie for me when I was growing up. <laughs> okay, so this idea that we can practice, 
what it means to be like Christ. That we can engage with the work that God is already doing in us to make us more like Christ. Not that we can accomplish it on our own. Not that we have the capacity within us to make it happen to ourselves. No, of course not. Not that we're talking about some Pelagian way of working our way to God. No. We're talking about partnering with, co-laboring alongside of, being co-laborers with God in the work that God is already doing in us. Of participating synergistically with the work that God is doing already. Of helping the kingdom come out there and in here. So what do I mean by spiritual practices? Well, there's lots of ways we could talk about what these are. There's lots of lists. I'll just mention two that have been profoundly transformative in Danae's in my life. So we're both PhD students. We're both working 60, 70 hour weeks. There's more work than there's time to do. And keeping Sabbath sometimes just feels like wax on, wax off, whatever. Except when we stop, when we take off our watches and stop mincing the minutes, trying to squeeze efficiency out of them, the texture of time changes. Sabbath is richer and fuller and more alive with the effective sense of God's presence. Not because God is more present in Sabbath than at any other moment in time, but because we have taken off the blinders just by stopping trying to make ourselves into more efficient, productive, capable people. That's part of God's wisdom in inviting us into Sabbath rest to recognize and realize and affirm that we are not our own makers. We are not responsible to make ourselves who we are supposed to be, but we are invited to co-labor with what God is already at work in the world to do. Another spiritual practice, being with the least of these. Seeking out the marginalized, the oppressed, those who have been ostracized from our communities, from our societies, and being with them. You know, this is such an astonishing thing we see Jesus doing again and again and again in the Gospels. He's going to the periphery of his community, and he's rehumanizing people by his presence with them. So the woman at the well, the disciples can't believe that Jesus is talking to her. Treating her like she's a human being. Treating her like she's a creature of God's. Treating her like she is someone deserving of respect and love. Being with. Thus rehumanizing. Or when he heals a man with leprosy, it's not just a physical healing, right? I mean, you all know this. It's not just that he no longer has leprosy. It's that he's been reintegrated into his entire community. He can go to worship. He can go back and pick up his kids. He can hold them. Whereas before, he was prohibited from touching them. He was prohibited from being in the same dwelling as his family. He couldn't go to the market. He couldn't participate in the economy. He couldn't go to the place of worship. He was completely excluded. And by healing this man, Jesus rehumanizes him. By going and being with those who are in radically different socioeconomic classes, who are in radically different socioeconomic positions in our communities. Why? To be reminded that in the kingdom of God, the point is not to amass more for ourselves, but rather to seek life, to seek flourishing, to seek the kingdom of God and God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. To be reminded of that in the midst of our frenetic and acquisitive and oh so addicted to both of those things, culture. So spiritual practices, this theological constellation of spiritual practices, our neuroplasticity, we can shape and form our minds. Our minds are malleable. They're not static. That we are being invited into being transformed and that we are co-laborers with God in that process. Not because we are able to accomplish it, but because God is already at work to do this. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we've come to the end of our time. Receive this benediction and blessing. 
May the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. Amen.